On January 1st, 1983, the internet was born in the US Department of Defense at a facility named ARPANET. And back in 1969, it was a tool of the Pentagon. But nowadays, just about anyone with a computer and a modem can join in, usually for a nominal fee. And brilliant minds behind it had one revolutionary idea, to create a decentralized network that could even survive a nuclear blast. The idea was very simple yet powerful. If one node fails, the rest of the network keeps running. No single point failure, no central command, true digital resilience. And for decades, this vision held strong. The internet became the backbone of our civilization, connecting billions of people across the continent, enabling commerce, communication and innovation. Everything. But somewhere along the way, we forgot the founding principle. Today, the internet isn't decentralized anymore. In fact, it's frighteningly centralized. And on October 28, 2025, the world learned this the hard way. So the breaking news this morning that many, many Americans are waking up to massive internet out outage impacting major... It turns out Amazon Web Services had a major outage. The outage of Amazon Web Services causing a number of high-profile websites... That morning, a single software update at Amazon Web Services triggered what only can be described as a digital apocalypse. Within hours, over 113 services collapsed globally. The banking apps went down, online couldn't process his booking, people's smart home becomes a dumb box, Reddit, Slack, Canva, Snapchat, even Amazon.com crashed itself. Six billion outage reports flooded across the planet. People can't access their money, hospital lost network connectivity, food delivery stopped and e-commerce froze. And here is the most terrifying part. It wasn't a cyber attack or a natural disaster. This was a routine update which has gone wrong in one company. Just think about this for one second. One company, one update, and half of the internet went down. So the question which we need to ask ourselves today is this. Just how did we go from a network which was designed to survive nuclear blasts to a digital house of cards that collapses because of a single software bug? And more importantly, what happens when the next time it occurs? Now, before diving into what actually happened, you need to understand what AWS actually is. Because most people think that Amazon sells books and toothpaste online. Here's a simple example for you to understand. Imagine you're booking a flight on Indigo's app right now. You open the app, search for the flight from Delhi to Mumbai. You select your seat and enter your card details and hit book now. In a split second here, what is actually happening behind the scenes? Your phone sends a request to that Indigo servers, but here is the thing. Indigo doesn't own any servers. They're renting them from Amazon Web Services. Your flight search is processed on AWS EC2 servers. Your payment information is stored on Amazon's S3 storage. And the confirmation email is sent via AWS Lambda functions. Even the app's logins depends upon AWS's DynamoDB database. But when you think that you are dealing with Indigo, you're actually dealing with Amazon's infrastructure. And it's not just Indigo. Netflix streams through AWS. Slack runs on AWS. Your banking app is probably running also on AWS. In fact, AWS controls 32% of the global cloud market. That's actually more than Azure and Google Cloud combined. That's over 1 million active customers across 245 countries. The entire digital backbone of our modern civilization runs through Amazon's data centers. So what exactly happened on 20th October? The first domino, the DynamoDB update. At approximately 7.30 AM ET, a AWS engineer pushed a routine technical update to its DynamoDB API. DynamoDB is essentially AWS's address book. It stores all the critical data, applications to find and retrieve information. Think of it as a phone directory of internet. But this update contained a bug. The second domino, the DNS failure. This bug triggered a failure at AWS DNS system, that's domain name system. So DNS is actually like an internet GPS. So when you type amazon.com in your browser, DNS translates that into the actual server address where the Amazon websites live. Without DNS, application literally cannot find where to send your address. The third domino, the health monitoring collapses. Here is where it gets worse. AWS uses something called network load balancer. These are basically traffic cops that distributes the incoming request across all the servers to prevent overload. And these load balancers have health monitors that consistently checks, is this server working? Can I send the traffic here? But guess what? Who the health monitor relied on? DNS. That's the very system that just failed. Now the load balancers cannot tell that which server is healthy and which server is not. They started randomly sending traffic to the broken servers. Error rates spiked 
connections dropped because everything at AWS is interconnected. The failure cascades like a row of falling dominoes. The complete collapse happened between 90 minutes. Now let me show you what meant this in real world. Single unit impact. When one AWS server fails, inconvenient but it's still manageable. Cascading failures. But when DNS fails, it's like cutting the power grid. Every service depend on it collapses simultaneously. Because modern applications don't just use one AWS service, they use dozen. So the effects multiplies exponentially. In banking, mobile banking apps couldn't verify your identity and credit card processing system froze. In healthcare, the hospital network that relies on cloud-based patient records went offline. Doctors couldn't access medical history. And in e-commerce, Amazon.com itself crashed. The irony wasn't lost on anyone. So after seeing everything collapse on October 20th, you're probably thinking, so should we just ditch AWS and go back to our own servers? And if I was a tech pessimist, I would say yes. But here is the reality. That ship has sailed. Cloud computing isn't optional anymore. It's the foundation of modern businesses. The solution isn't to abandon the cloud, but to stop it treat like a single point of failure. The smartest companies in the world aren't choosing between cloud and on-premise. They are doing both. And here is how. So here is the core principle. Critical operations stay close and everything else scale to cloud. Come to think of it, you don't keep all your money under your mattress, but you also don't put every rupee in one stock. You diversify. So what this actually look like? Take JP Morgan's case. When AWS went, their core banking kept running. Why? Because they run a hybrid approach. Critical stuff like money transfer, account access, and authentication, their own dedicated servers. And flexible stuff like marketing, analytics, and customer apps, they use AWS as scalability backup layer. So when AWS collapsed, customer can still withdraw money and make payments. The mobile app was slower, but the bank didn't collapse. And look at Netflix, they're almost entirely on AWS. But they have architected so brilliantly that when one region fails, traffic instantly routes to another. And how? because they are actively diversing it to Azure and Google Cloud as a secondary backup. So here is what it really comes down to. We need to stop optimizing for convenience and start optimizing for resilience. So for 15 long years, everyone asked, what's the easiest? And the answer always was AWS. But October 28 has taught us easy isn't the same as safe. So the internet was designed to survive nuclear war through decentralization. But today we have built a digital economy that couldn't survive a software bug at one company. And don't forget to subscribe to Red Switches for more such content.